Hello, everybody. Welcome along to another week of the Health Wealth podcast. We're joined by a guest this week to have an interesting chat about his story. We're joined by Sal. We're going to dig into uh, all the things that he's been through and his journey to get to where he is today. Uh, first of all, uh, how are you doing, Sal? I'm doing very well. Thank you very much. I'm good. Good. That is good to hear. Sunny um, day, catching a bit yeah. of sun. <laughs> Can't ask for more, especially, especially in the UK. Any sunny day we get is a blessing. Well, I'm in five, so slightly further north. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even less likely. And we, we've got Barry is here as well. He's he's closer to you. Barry's in Glasgow, so he's uh, he's further north like you. Okay. Yeah, West Coast. <laughs> Hi, Barry. <laughs> Hi, Sal. Nice to meet you. Great to have you Thank on. You, mate. Thank you. Um, so I figured you've got a real interesting story. There's a lot of points that I'd like to um, get to and discuss, but as with any story, uh, it's probably a good idea to start kind of back at the beginning. So what, what okay. um, did you find? I know you, you mentioned that as a kid, you had a, a tendency for being overweight um, and you actually, you ended up having fatty liver disease, I think quite young. So could you just run us through yeah, some sure. of that? Yeah. Um, well, when I was a young lad, I was put into a boarding school, well, orphanage at the age of three. And um, by the time I changed school to the second one at the age of eight, um, whenever they brought me toys, I would swap them for condensed milk. So I began to abuse my body very young. <laughs> And, uh, you know, condensed milk, you don't see it much these days. You know, it's really, really sweet. And I just used to drink it out of a can. And by the time I came to the UK, I discovered butter. I never tasted butter in my life before. All I ever had was olive oil with, with sugar on my sandwiches at the school. And I couldn't stop eating the butter. It was amazing. I was, I still even remember, remember the name, it was Anka Butter. And it was just amazing. And then I went to secondary school and I discovered apple pie and custard cream. And it was downhill from them on, really. <laughs> and um, by, the time I, by the time I reached uh, 15, my mom said, oh, you know, uh, if you keep growing, I'm going to have to lend you my bras because I was so fat. Um, my boobs were really big. And by this time, I was putting five teaspoonfuls of sugar into my tea. I mean, it was so sweet. I used to cough after I drank it. You know? <laughs> it was just sickly sweet. So it's no surprise, really, that once I started working, I went to work in a... Um, it was the smallest private, the largest private hotel in the center of London. And uh, one day we were left there in the evening and there was a couple of girls and there was another waiter with me and he had access to the drinks cabinet. So, so, you know, let's go and have a drink and we'll have a good time and blah, blah, blah. So I had one glass in which he put some Canadian, I don't know, bourbon, like something, something. It was, it was hard liquor as far as I was concerned. And I drank a bit of that and I was so sick. They went off, had a good time. I went to the basement of the hotel. I was sick as a dog. I've never been so sick in my life. I was, that was my first experience that alcohol and me did not mix. And it was because already my liver had it was fatty liver already, but I didn't know this at the time. And uh, the years went by. I, I sort of got a bit better and a bit worse because I would do more exercise, less exercise. Um, but by the time I got married, second time around, um, we'd gone to this um, wedding. And by now I had a couple of kids as well, and a wife in tow. So we go to this wedding 
and I just had one little glass of white wine. And uh, it was time for us to go. We got into the car. I'm driving. I mean, I hadn't, I hadn't drunk much. And I'm sort of pulling back and pulling forward and pulling back. My wife says, you're drunk. I said, I've only had a little bit of wine. <laughs> <laughs> My liver just could not process. And after that, whenever I tried to drink any alcohol, I would literally fall asleep. Much how it began. Um, you know, by this time, I was into my 40s. I'd, I'd become an acupuncturist. I was um, telling other people, don't have too much sugar, not good for you. But I loved my, my chocolate biscuits and I loved my ice cream. And by the time I reached 50, just out of the blue, I just went whoop, and I I put about three or four stones on. I just mm. went heavy, just like that. It it was sudden, and what had kept me going was, you know, I used to do a lot of martial arts, and you know, I was really physical. I was very busy, so that used to counteract it to some stage. But there came a moment when I become totally um, sugar. Uh, what do you call it? Um, Dependent. Pardon me? Sugar dependent. Insulin, insulin, insulin resistant. Oh, oh insulin, insulin resistant, resistant. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I reached that point, my cells had said enough. And then I just began to put the weight on really fast. And that's pretty much how the whole thing began. Um, and, you know, I'd, I'd gone from being a vegan, uh, you know, like I, I was. 18 year olds, I was like, what do I do? What's the answer here? How do I lose weight? Well, to begin with, I began to vomit. Uh, the Romans did it, so I thought, great idea. <laughs> so I started vomiting. And of course, then I did dope. And uh, then I got the munchies. And then I did even more. So it was like constant cycle of vomiting. And this took me till I was 24, 25. And then I stopped all of that and began to take care of myself. But it took till I was 40 when I, I did a special course. And in this course, I connected with my stomach. And when I looked inside, it was all gunchy and horrible. And I did some sort of work, emotional work on myself in this course whilst I was doing this course. And at the end of the session, as I was coming out, I went back to the stomach. And I, as, as I came into this room, which was all yucky and the, the tissues were like sort of meat, but soggy and it was just horrible. But as I walked into this place, into my stomach, it was like being in a cathedral. Suddenly there was like a, a multicolored glass and the line shone through it. And the walls suddenly transformed themselves. And that was the beginning of healing, really, in a way. And, uh, but it didn't take me far enough because I still became insulin resistant. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know then that I had become diabetic, that I had been diabetic for quite a while. Uh, so I said that I was, I was vegan for a few years trying to change everything, but that didn't work for very long. It worked for about six months because I had this urge, this need. It began sort of coming to my dreams that I needed to eat some fish. Finally, as a come, I said, well, you know, if, if, my, if, if, my, if my mind is telling me eat some fish, then maybe I should, and I did. And I started to feel so much better because I've been getting palpitations in my heart. You know, I was only 28 at the time. I was getting these palpitations. And, but that stopped. And then I was just vegetarian for a long time. And the funny thing about being a vegetarian is that you feel okay. <laughs> you know, everything was okay. For quite a while, I was young, and my body could cope with these things. And... um. 
but I was forever looking for supplements and I, I was always taking supplements to help myself. And I think that was my saving grace. The fact that I was taking multivitamins that contain the B vitamins as well as vitamin C. And so it wasn't too bad until my wife got pregnant and she'd been a vegetarian for 20 years. And she suddenly had a urge to have some meat. And I reasoned that, I said, well, you know, you're pregnant and if you get this urge to eat meat, I think you should go for it. And her own indoctrination about being a vegetarian made it really hard, but she succumbed and she began to eat a bit of, a bit of meat. I think it was chicken at the time. She couldn't quite make it to, uh, to red meat. <laughs> Uh, but nevertheless, she got she she felt better, and so that was the in a way that was like the beginning of questioning because when you're indoctrinated and all your friends also they all do vegetarian, you don't question. You think it's good. You think it's the right thing to do, and why should you even question anything? You just go along with it, and so. I survived reasonably well, but as my kiddies began to grow, I did begin to put in a little bit of meat here and there because they wanted it. <laughs> so, but it wasn't much because, you know, we're still like, you know, vegetables is good for you. But once I started to put the weight on, I had to begin questioning. And I wasn't questioning the being a vegetarian at the moment. What I was questioning was the fact that I was eating too much sugar. And my oldest boy by now, he said, you know, you've you got to stop the sugar. The joke is I was telling other people, you know, cut down on the sugar. Um, but once it hit me, I began to do that. And this is when the problems began. And this is the importance of if one is a type 2 diabetic and you're primarily vegetarian with a little bit of meat here and there, sort of like chicken and eggs, uh, nevertheless, if you decide to give up on the sugars, you've got to give up the lectins. And this you won't hear out there because the lectins, which they're a protein, which are usually on the surface of, of the seeds um, and they can be washed away to some extent and they can be boiled away to some extent, but some will always remain. And if those lectins, that lectin protein, because this lectin protein is in a ring circle, it does not break down in the stomach. The acid, the stomach acids that do not break it down. So it goes through into the small intestine. And once it reaches the small intestine, usually it's not a problem because the lectin will bond to sugars in the vegetables, in the seeds, in other, you know, from other seeds. And it will go through your system. However, if you happen to be unfortunate as I was, I had been eating uh, with um, aluminum utensils and I had created leaky gut in my small intestines. The, uh, the metal had damaged the lining of my, of my small intestine and that had created a gap and the lectins could now travel through into my bloodstream. And because I had been giving up the sugars, there was nothing in the food for the lectins to bind to. So they had free range in my body. And this took me a couple of years to work it all out. But what happened was that in giving up the sugars, I said, well, what do I have? So I was eating a lot of salads and I was having a lot of peppers and tomatoes, nightshade family, which got a lot of lectins. And I began to get physical symptoms. I began to get um, um, redness in my groin, which uh, is from a, um, a fungal infection. And my nails, were getting fungal infections in my toes. And I was getting a lot, well, 
in my website, I've got a whole lot of symptoms. I can't think of them right now, but there were just so many things like my eyes were being affected. Um, anyway, well, it's enough there. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything at the moment, but there were just a lot of, there was a lot of symptoms coming up and they were due to the lectins. And gradually I began to work this out and to realize that I had to give up all the seeds. And then I learned that um, one of the, the biggest problems is seed oils, not just the seeds, but the seed oil itself. Um, the linoleic acid, this seed oil, and you know, I, I used to have, I used to love mayonnaise, Hellman's mayonnaise. 5% olive oil, what could be wrong, right? You know, it, it, it wasn't until a few years back that I looked at the label and I realized it's 87% 80, rapeseed oil. It's pure poison. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm not trying to put helmets down, but hey, it's pure poison. <laughs> it is. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, of course, once you start looking, it's everywhere. And the problem, the problem is that the linoleic acid from the seed oils damages the mitochondria of the cells. And it's a double whammy because the insulin resistance, it, <laughs> linking up to the linoleic acid between the two of them, they're so damaging to the body, it's unbelievable. Anyway, I gave up the linoleic acid and I gradually moved from eating the salads, took me a few years, giving up the, all the nightshade families. And then I went on an exclusion diet. I went on um, chicken and broccoli. And I did that for a while. And that was great, it helped. And then I began to introduce foods and I realized I was allergic to everything under the sun. And eventually I, I realized that, okay, let's go for carnival. Let's just go pure carnival. And even that had problems to begin with. I mean, I'm five years down the line, I'm now fully carnival. Um, I I am totally keto, if that's the right word. I burn fat. I do not. I mean, I'm sure that my body creates um, a bit of sugar now and then from the meat, and that's all good. You know, I'm surviving really well now. But for a few years, it was a nightmare. It was a nightmare because when you're type two diabetic, you cannot mix it. First of all. As I was experimenting, I, well, I, I could have a few uh, blackberries or blueberries. I could have a few blueberries or I could have a banana. <laughs> I could have a bit of this. As soon as I began to do any of that, I started to put the weight on because the fruits, they're, they're fructose. And my body will turn that straight away into fat. I mean, like, so gradually I realized that I had, to, I had to just be pure carnival, but there were problems because my, my cells had been damaged. If you're, type two, if you're type two diabetic, you have damaged a lot of, not all of them, but depends on what time, you know, how badly you've gone down the road, but your, your mitochondria is damaging a lot of the cells. The mitochondria is the energy is the engine, is how we get energy. And if it's damaged, you cannot burn the fat. So you've given up the sugar, <laughs> but you can't burn the fat. So like, oh, groggy, I used to go, I used to go to CrossFit. And it's like, uh, I, I couldn't think. I mean, like I was just so like out of it. I, I just followed other people and did the best I could, but it took me a long time. And 
I also, because of my damage, I also needed to keep taking vitamin C. Now, today, now that I'm fully five years on the road, I am now just meat and fat. I eat nothing else. And I no longer need vitamin C because there is enough vitamin C in the meat to fill my small needs. Most of the vitamin C we need it because we eat oxalic acid. I, we eat vegetables, we eat seeds, and those are damaging to the body. We eat the, the wrong oils. Um, and we need the vitamin C to counteract that. So there was, there was this whole journey that I had to go through to become normal. And now I'm normal. But it was very, very tough for quite a while. One thing that is really important if you're type 2 diabetic and you're, you just said, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm going on this journey. I want to get healthy. And this is the way forward. I need to be careful. I need to learn what to do. But one of the things you really need to do is you need to be aware that when you start to get the muscle spasms, which will happen, um, you need to take a little bit of sugar. You need a little bit of carb, not much. Um, but if you have uh, a quarter of a cup full of rice two or three times a week or a half a teaspoonful of honey, that's all you need, no more. Just enough to put some carbs into the muscles. And that will help you with the muscle spasms. You know, I spent years with muscle spasms thinking, oh, it's the salt, then I have too much salt. Well, if you're type 2 diabetic, you damage your kidneys. So the last thing you need is too much salt. The less salt, the better. Um, uh, magnesium, oh God, I was putting magnesium baths. I was making things 10 times worse. All these things of uh, what they call it, when uh, the uh, the electrolytes, uh, to, you've got to have your electrolytes. Yeah. It's not it's not electrolytes. It's sugar. It's the fact that your mitochondria cannot burn the fat properly, and so you need to keep a little bit of sugar in there, not much, just a little bit, just so that your, your muscles get a respite. Because these muscle spasms, they invariably would happen in the middle of the night, yeah? And so that little bit of, that little bit of carb is all you need. Anyway, there you go, I've, I've, I've said enough for now. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine, it's, in, it's interesting. And it kind of highlights a lot of the points which we kind of talk about on the podcast anyway, which is that, um, everything is kind of it's very personalized and everyone has their own yeah. personal journey and you can't just say do this it worked for me so it worked for you and you know your journey kind of highlights that um, and you've got to be careful and like you said with someone who's a type 2 diabetic if, if your body's been through a lot of abuse um, in terms of food over the years just jumping straight into something as strict as strict carnivore is going to give you issues so we try and encourage people that you know, if you're, if you're jumping into it, especially from a really bad diet to gradually do it um, and, and gradually try to go into it, which is a much better way, which is obviously, you know, backed up by what you found as well, because your body can't just jump from, oh, it's full rubbish, full rubbish. Oh yeah. Now, now just operate normally like you meant to, like it, it needs time to adjust um, as with everything. So it's interesting that you, that you, you basically found and proved exactly that along your journey, which is, which is what we really talk about and things like the, the seed oils um, and, and the dangers of vegetables as well is another thing that we kind of preach of like, yes, they've got some goodness in them, but you know, that there's, there's a lot of stuff in them that's not good as well. Um, and, and the, some of the toxins in them will probably contribute into your leaky gut as well as the aluminium. Um, cause I know they can cause that and the, the fiber from them can cause leaky gut as well. Cause it's the roughage is a bit too rough for your gut. The human gut doesn't really need that if, fiber. I don't know if that is true. I mean, yeah, we certainly don't need fiber, but I don't know if that's strictly true. Um, certainly the oxalic acid mm -hmm. within the, within the, um, usually the primary culprit for most people is bread is, is the wheat. Yeah. That, that is the worst out of all of them because it's like 
breakfast, lunch, and dinner, right? You know, yeah. cocoa pops for breakfast, uh, or uh, a little bit of sawdust with your cornflakes. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, it, but but they're all full of oxalic acid, and it, it, it's it, it, people have no idea how bad it is. They just and no, and they don't believe us. They don't believe us. They struggle. So, yeah. That's it. That's why it's it's that's why we like to share the personal stories because us saying something, like you say, especially when people are so it's ingrained into them and kind of brainwashed into thinking a certain way, us saying something doesn't mean that much. But if someone's, you know, if you if you've physically been there and you've experienced it and you share your story, that kind of means a bit more to people, I think, um, having that actual experience from someone. And also, obviously, if they experience it themselves, if they're willing to try it and they see the difference. Then, then that's good as well. What, what was your? I know you, you kind of touched on it earlier. You, you only spent about six months. You said as a vegan. What, what kind of? I know you said you had palpitations. Was there any other kind of negative side effects you experienced from that? I don't remember. <laughs> all, all I remember is a long time ago. You know, I'm seventy now. You know, I mean, yeah. I was twenty eight at the time. So, what were we talking about? Fifty years ago. You know. So, I remember what I vividly remember is that I had moved out of London and I had this lovely Victorian flat and I made a deal with the landlady that I would redecorate it inside because we were talking like high 12 foot ceilings, you know, like 17 inch rooms. Yeah, I mean, like huge. And I was working in the evenings, just decorating and I was getting the palpitations and I don't, I don't know what the state of my health truly was because, you know, 28 is pretty young <laughs> nowadays to me, <laughs> it's pretty young. And uh, we've, the human body is such an amazing organism. There's lots of reserves in it. And at the time, um, I wasn't doing as many vegetable oils as later on in my life. So, my my body was still, yeah, I've been damaging it with all the vomiting and all of that earlier on, but nevertheless, it was still reasonably pristine. Um, so you, I think it was just the palpitations that I, I was missing something and uh, the oil, the, the not the oil, the, the fish and the oil in the, in, the, in the fish gave me whatever it was that I needed. Um, but then, you know, vegetarian for a long time, and the problem with being a vegetarian is that people still have a lot of bread, they have a lot of cheese, they have a lot of sweets, a lot of sugary stuff. And you know, being a vegetarian, I'm not I'm not gonna put down a vegetarian. If you are if you're listening and <laughs> you are a vegetarian and you say, you know what, I don't care. I want to stay a vegetarian because I can't bear the thought of an animal being killed on my behalf. Fair enough. So in that case, you need to have vitamin Bs, especially the B12. You won't find vitamin B12 unless you have eggs or unless you have a fermented cabbage. They are the only, because vitamin B12 in the cow is created by bacterial fermentation. And that's the only source of vitamin 12. So unless we eat the meat, we don't get vitamin B12, unless you fermented yourself outside of a stomach, i.e. with, you know, use the bacteria to ferment it. So it's, you desperately need to have loads of that. And I mean loads of that, because the, the oxalic acids, they're damaging, but if you stay away from spinach um, and uh, rhubarb and uh, peanuts and cashew nuts, especially almonds and um, um, sweet potatoes, uh, cassava, you know, some of them are so, so bad. But if you stay away from those and you stay purely to whatever grows locally, but you still need protein, of course. So then you're gonna have to eat uh, soya, which contains 
all the proteins. Um, quinine, quinine, uh, quinine? Is, are they called quinine? Quinoa. 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 They contain all the essential amino acids. So, you know, there's a few of them which contain this. Now, you can see that this cannot be for the masses because they only grow in certain places. There isn't enough for the whole world. Um, we do, in my opinion, we do need to have some red meat, not all the time, but we do need to have red meat. But if you say, no, I'm not going there, fine. But you need to have, you need to make sure you have the whole complement of amino acids. That's not too difficult to do in this day and age when you can get food from all over the world. So you can get the right stuff. However, and you need to make sure that you boil all the seeds, you, you soak them all, so you extract the, um, the lectin from it as much as possible. And if you follow all that, you will live, live to a reasonably ripe old age. Why not? As long as you stay away from the heavy, the heavy vegetables that contain oxalic acid, because that is so damaging to the body, you have no idea. And you need to stay away from the, um, from the seed oils. Now, you know, if you go to a health food shop, a so-called health food shop, what do they sell? They sell nuts. They said um, things like sesame, uh, so sort of sesame oils and uh, sunflower oils, and you get all this sort of spread, sunflower spread and sesame spread, etc. All of those are poisonous. You have no idea how poisonous they are. If you go and you say, "Oh, I'll eat, I'll eat some uh, some nuts," I'll, I'll, I don't know, uh, have some um, ah, walnuts, <laughs> for example. Any of them. There's a whole variety of those. So you know they've already they've already been dehulled, and you now buy a packet. It's been standing there for six months, for all you know. And when you eat those, and I've had them in the past, sometimes you get the old one and it's really runs at you. Oh, that's pure poison. And even the ones that don't go, uh, they're still poison because as soon as you dehulled them, in connection with the oxygen, the oil in them begins to go rancid. If you, if you buy some fresh and you dehulled them and you eat them, you know, no biggie, it's not a big deal. But once they've been dehulled and they're left somewhere for any length of time, and you then go and you eat those, you're poisoning yourself. So if you take all these caveats on board, you can still have a healthy life as a, uh, as a vegetarian, but you still need to go for low glycemic foods. You need to stay away from, sugar is deadly, sugar is a poison. It doesn't matter how you, how you call it, it's a poison, but, if you keep away from the seed oils, then the chances are that you will not be damaging your mitochondria to any significant extent, especially if you keep away from the high glycemic sugars. And you know, you could do it, you know, it's doable. So I'm not going to sort of proselytize and says, no, you've got to be carnivore with me. You can't be a vegetarian but you have to put the work into it. You, you cannot just go and have cheesecake. <laughs> I think that's my meal for the day. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it sounds like it's a lot more nuanced, you know, being a vegetarian as opposed to a meat eater style. Absolutely. So there's a lot more that goes into it and there's a lot of detail, there's a lot of planning and you can't really afford to make much you know, either um, cause effects, the other things that, that can happen, um, some of which you've touched on. So, um, whereas opposed to a meat eater, you you have a predominantly, you know, it doesn't even need, you don't even need to be, you know, full carnivore, but if you have a fairly large amount of meat and you have a bit of sugar or a bit of carbs, then that evens it out. You know, you can get away with more, um, if you will. So it's interesting to hear you talk about the, you know, the, the, the details of that. Hmm. Yeah, and I think the like yeah. you touched on there with the B12, I mean, pretty much all vegans and vegetarians will have deficiencies of some sort. And, and B12 is one of the main ones, which kind of, like you said, you know, if someone is really careful as a vegetarian and they really 
contrary on what they do, they, they could, you know, they could probably live reasonably healthy, but obviously we're trying to aim for, we're talking about optimal health that we, that we're trying to achieve. And there's no way a diet can be optimal that requires you to take a load of supplements with it. And yeah. that, that, that's my personal view of it. And, you know, as you said, if someone wants to still eat their vegetables and that's entirely their choice, we're not trying to force anyone to do anything, but I think a, an optimal diet for everyone would be animal based, whether someone adds vegetables in or they add, you know, a tiny bit of carbs now. And again, like you said, at one point you had to, you know, that that's where you can play. But I, th- I think anyone who's not eating animal products, they're going to be deficient um, in, in a lot of stuff, which, which kind of, um, is proven by a lot of vegans and vegetarians and, and a lot of them can only put up with it for a couple of years before they have to actually change. I mean, I don't know how many years you, I suppose with vegetarian, you, did you say you still ate some eggs and things like that when you were vegetarian? Yeah, it, it wasn't, I mean, I, I always had the old egg here and there. Yeah, it's a, but I, what I wouldn't have is I wouldn't have any red meat. That was a definite no, no, because you know, I believed it. I believed that red meat gave you cancer. Cancer in the colon, it putrefies in your stomach, in your intestines, you know, ugh, red meat, no. But you know, if you stop to think about it, it's ridiculous. For, for starters, the stomach is designed to release acids to break the protein down into its amino acid constituents. So the meat goes through and you know what? Nothing comes out the other end because the meat is totally absorbed in the body. There, there, is, there is no bits of meat floating around going towards the colon. Nothing gets that far. It doesn't go past the stomach, it's liquid. Now fat goes through and fat will um, there's some bacteria, certainly in me, there's some bacteria that will uh, interact with the fat. And so that gives me a little bit of a, uh, what do you call it, uh, bacterial life in my small intestines. I don't know, you know, like people talk about probiotics and they need to have the right, I don't know how true that is once you are pure carnivore. Yeah, because I, in I, theory. Yeah, I don't think there's any any need for it. I think probiotics don't um, give really any of the benefits they try and try and say they do. And the, the the whole kind of obsession with the gut microbiome. Obviously, you do have bacteria in your gut that do stuff, but the kind of obsession with it and the probiotics is, is basically just a myth for them selling products. And like you said, especially once you're on a proper diet, that there's no need for that stuff. Hmm. But also, I I and I don't know if this is true. It's, it's just a gut feeling that uh, once you become carnivore in the full sense of the word, a lot of the bacteria that used to thrive, sugar loving bacteria for starters, they all go the way of the dodo. You know, they disappear, they die, gone, rip, because they have nothing to feed on. And so, I mean, I have a bowel movement that my, my bowel movement is primarily dead cells. It's the dead cells from, from the gut. Um, and I think uh, some of the dead cells, because they interact with the fat, and um, that's it. I mean, I don't think there's much, my, my, the, the amount of different bacteria that survive in my gut, I think is very singular. I don't think there's many varieties anymore. Um, because they can't do much with the meat. <laughs> it's only the fat. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, one of the issues actually with, with um, fructose that there's, you know, bad bacteria in your gut, which feed off fructose. And obviously your body doesn't, doesn't you really use the fructose for anything. Um, and so that if, if you're having a lot of fructose, that, that bacteria kind of starts to take over the good bacteria in your stomach. And yep. it, it leads to IBS and bloating and, and gas and all, all those digestive problems. So that's exactly what you're saying there. If you feed the wrong bacteria, then it, then it probably is going to come unbalanced. It's just a matter of down to your diet. Yeah, that was true for me. Mm. It, it got to the ridiculous point when if I just had just a tiny little bit of honey 
or just a tiny bit of bread, just anything that would turn into sugar in my, in my mouth and go down. Within 10 minutes, I would go to my wife and say, I don't understand this, look at me. And I'd bloat up, my tummy was distended. And you know, it was horrible and it would last for hours because of course, it, you know, the wind comes in, it's got to go out. <laughs> <laughs> but I had totally the wrong bacteria in my guts, totally. So. Yeah. Yeah. No. Absolutely. That is. That's. Uh, people don't really. A lot of people, I think, when they don't think about eating, people just eat. They they don't think about what it's doing in your body and and the effects it has on you. Uh, a lot of people just eat for the sake of eating. And if they stop to think about it, they might make better choices. And also, you touched on it a bit earlier that the information out there is so bad. Like you, you were, you know, you were told red meat causes cancer. You know, we're, we grow up being told fat and cholesterol causes heart disease and, you know, red meat's bad. And then and then we find out actually they're the best things for us. So it, it's a shame that, you know, so, a lot of people out there probably think they're being healthy, but actually they're just being misled um, with the wrong information. So it's a real shame, really. Yes. It's double speak. It's mm. the Orwellian nightmare. You know, we have health food shops. We have health centers. Yeah. Everything is, if you, we've got healthy probiotics, you know, everything is about health. They put the word in health and people who are none the wiser, why would they be? Oh, you know, oh, I want to be healthy. I'll have this just to be healthy. But all they're doing is poisoning themselves or yes, poisoning themselves with <laughs> in different ways. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah, I saw, saw an example of that the other day when I was walking out of the gym and I actually saw, well, I saw, I see this quite often, but you know, some, somebody walking into the gym passing me with an energy drink and, you know, something from Sainsbury's that's got chicken in it, it doesn't cross their mind about all the, um, all the bad stuff that's in that as well, the preservatives and the sugar. You know, and 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 that's before they've even worked out. You know, so that 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 their body has to deal with that and deal with the strain of working out as well as the repair aspect of it after the workout. When they've got all these things floating around in their bodies, you see. So, yeah, that that, that that's just another one of many examples that we discuss about. Um, you know, people mm. being misled and think that they're doing the right thing. You know, because commercially. It says so, but actually it's not so. You know, I go to a CrossFit three times a week and um, the lads who run it, lovely lads, really good, you know, really good at what they do. They know what they're doing. They're very good at teaching. They're very good at supporting. But the diets are atrocious. These guys, they do lots of hours in their training because they also like to compete. But every time I look at them, I am horrified because they're forever eating sweet cakes, sugar stuff. And they, they, they think that they need it for their energy. But the other day with one of them, I said, young lad, I said, you see that thing on your neck? That's a tag. That is the beginnings of insulin resistance. And, you know, it's also full of spores and all manner of things. And it's all because of the food. And they're not aware that it's the food that's doing them. I sort of let them know that they know now that I'm a carnivore, that I do this. I, I try not to proselytize. I try not to sort of shove it down their throats. But it is sudden, saddening. It, it makes me very sad when I can see the damage visibly on their skin of what they're doing to themselves because they have been sold hook, line and sinker that we get our energy from carbohydrates. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, on. There's, there's really, um, and two points on that, there's really interesting research by Professor Tim Noakes. I don't know if you've heard of him in South Africa. Yeah, so... Um, he's done really interesting research on firstly the fact that we don't need and um, that carbs don't give any um, athletic performance benefits obviously a lot of people 
who are really into gym and into fitness and they say, well, I can't drop the carbs because I won't be able to perform as good. But he's done a lot of um, work with um, and a lot of research with top level athletes. And they found that firstly, it doesn't. And the other thing he's found, because he was a top level athlete and he was diagnosed as type two diabetic um, once he retired. Uh, and he believes from working with athletes throughout his career that probably at least 90 percent of top level athletes are type two diabetic. But because the amount of exercise they're doing, the amount of carbs that they're burning off, their body manages to survive with it. But once they retire and they stop, they're going to balloon and, uh, and they'll be diagnosed as type 2 diabetic because it's carbs, this, they've got the, the glucose drinks and everything. And he said, especially like long distance runners, he said they're basically all um, type 2 diabetic, but they just, they just don't know it yet because they're burning it off. And that's probably the same as the guys at, at mm, the gym. Yeah. You know, yeah. people used to eat, people used to eat sugar. In, in times past. Um, certainly at the beginning of the century, uh, people were having sugar because the sugar had been sort of processed, I don't know, in the 1700s, something like that. Um, once they began to sort of take it out of the sugar cane, uh, Tate and Lyle, I think <laughs> in England. And so people used to have sugar, but it wasn't deadly. The thing is, that it's not till they began to create what they call vegetable oil at the beginning of the 20th century. That is when the problem began because that seed oil began to damage the mitochondria. And then the person could no longer burn fat effectively. You know, my car, uh, I've got a diesel car and a couple of weeks back, I made a mistake. I put petrol in. I managed to drive it home. Couldn't get it started again. <laughs> it was the wrong fuel. <laughs> <laughs> the, the human body is exactly the same. Absolutely. It's a little bit more give and take on it. But the end result is the same. If you put yeah. the wrong fuel in, you get buggered. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. That's what we try and tell people. And, you know, unlike with the car, it, it can take a bit longer in, in with humans it, and it can, it can be kind of long term. That, that's why, you know, you say to people, oh, you know, telling them that, you, you know, try not to eat so much of this and that. And they say, well, I'm well, I'm fine and I've been eating it. So, well, yeah, you think you're fine, but in, inside you're not. And over time, it's going to get worse and worse. And I think you, you mentioned it slightly earlier that when you were younger, your body probably dealt with stuff and you, you might have been more sick than you, you knew or do more damage than you knew. And that, that is true when, when people are young. Everyone, I'm sure, experienced that when they were young. You could eat whatever you wanted. Basically felt that you had no effects. Obviously, it was having long-term effects that you just couldn't see. It's just when you get older, you kind of see and feel the effects a lot quicker. But everything mm -hmm. you do, I think, I can't remember where it's from. There's a quote that um, everything you eat or drink, you're either poisoning yourself or healing yourself. It's, you know, you, you have to make that choice with everything you do, whether you want to do good or bad to yourself. You know, it's important to recognize the dynamics that we have developed a society, a culture that is poisoning itself on the outside because we are poisoning ourselves on the inside. And we have made a virtue out of poisoning ourselves. You know, I've got family, they come and oh, they, uh, they like to create all these lavish meals and there's so much that goes into the preparation and the finding the right foods and the taste and the quality and the colors. And you've got this amazing spread and it's all poison, but it looks good. And then everyone sits around the table and they all share of the poison and you know, and, and it's all addictive. So addiction likes company. So everybody sits and they all have a great time and they drink their bottles of wine and they have one meal and no one thinks twice that two hours later they're starving and they've got to go and have something else. I mean, I used to get really like, once I became carnival, my wife wasn't and they would sit around the table and uh, they, would, <laughs> they would have, their plate would be twice the size of what I ate. And then after a while, pudding, and then two hours later, going through the cupboards to see what there is to, to, munch, to munch on, just to keep going. 
because the sugar just, <laughs> I mean, you have to experience it. it. It is the worst poison for the human body. Um, and people don't, don't, I mean, I never thought, I, mean, I used to love treating myself to little custard pies and ice cream and this, that, the other. Ugh. Anyway. Yeah. Oh, it's true. There's, we've spoke about before the um, fruct again, fructose. Um, it prevents the signal of being full going to your your brain as well. So you you just keep eating. People overeat so easily with sugar, don't they? Because your your body's literally it, obviously it's not getting the nutrients anyway, but it's literally not being able to tell itself it's full because it, it's blocking the signals. So yeah, you just yeah. keep eating and eating. Yeah. Well, it's the same as cocaine, right? You start smoking, yeah. never done it, but you start snorting yeah. cocaine, you never know when to stop. Yeah. You know, you start from morning, you can keep going snorting, snorting, snorting. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> from the stories I hear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, sugar's a it's a drug, isn't it? I think they've shown that it has absolutely pretty similar effects to heroin and, and crack cocaine on the human brain. So. I think a lot of people, the majority of people, I think, are, are addicted to food or addicted to sugar, but they don't realize it. Because as well, I think people don't realize there's sugar in everything. You yeah. say to someone you're addicted to sugar and they just think chocolate and they say, no, I could give chocolate up for a bit. It's like, no, but 90% of your diet is sugar. So try giving it all yeah. up <laughs> yeah. and then see how you feel. Well, you know, yeah. I, my kids, I mean, I used to do this with my kids. You know, I, I used to hide the chocolates away from them when it was Easter, people came and gave chocolates out to put them out of the way so they forget about it and then make them disappear. But then I'd give them Cocoa Pops in the morning. <laughs> yeah. And the amount of sugar in the breakfast cereal is unbelievable. Mm. Or um, yeah. Frosties, I used to give them Frosties. I used to be Frosties myself. You know? I mean, you just don't realize that every time you have one of something like this, you're overloaded. I mean, if you just have a potato, it's like having tens, 10 teaspoonfuls of sugar, um, that's just an ordinary potato. People have no idea of um, that every time you, you eat all these foods, you're, you're spiking, you're spiking, and your body needs to release insulin to mop it up and get rid of it. So, Yeah, we, we, we've covered uh, the cereal uh, subject a number of times, mm -hmm. and it's, it's, it's something that's tremendously well marketed. As a as a necessary, um, you know, as a necessary Absolutely. part of your day, your daily day, but also having it, we know it's full of sugar and and there's there's nothing good in it and, and oats and the, the porridge as well. But also just having it in the morning, as soon as you wake up, your body's already having to do work to process that and shift shift through that. So soon after waking up, instead of um, you know doing all the other restor mm -hmm. restorative work that it can do, um, which is why, you know, myself and, and Ryan are quite, uh, we're into the, the, the fasting um, aspect of it, but just putting that into your body straight, uh, as soon as you wake up, it's, you're just, you're actually ending your day before it's almost started effectively, you know? So, yeah. Uh, and um, yeah. It's a sad world we live in. It's very sad. Yeah. But, you know, the, the powers of um, advertising, it, they're so insidious. They're everywhere. They're in everything. Yeah. And people, you know, the average person, they're not that clued in. Um, you know, there's a lot of intelligent people out there, but they don't necessarily have common sense. Um, you know, we... <laughs> We don't question enough, but why? But it, you wouldn't. You don't need to question when you've been lulled to sleep day in day out. You know, you, the whole society keeps us in a state of lullness. Yeah. Lullaby. Anyway. Yeah. Um, something I'd like to share. Yeah. Which is that um, is to do with uh, you. You've been type two diabetic for X amount of time. And now you say, look, I'm, I'm ready. I'm gonna go for it. I'm gonna become carnivore. And one of the worst things to assume is that because you're now carnivore that you can give up the vitamin B12. 
Uh, and there's a number of there's a number of things you need to keep taking because if you've been vegetarian for a long time, or even if you haven't been vegetarian, but you've been primarily eating a lot of vegetables for a long time, you've been maybe having the smoothies thinking I'm gonna lose weight by having these spinach smoothies, you know, you've been accumulated so much oxalic acid into your body. That is, you've, you're now carrying a store of oxalic acid. And as soon as you stop eating, foods that contain oxalic acid, your body says, oh, okay, I can start to get rid of the storage because oxalic acid needs to be processed. Now, oxalic acid is so insidious. It, it binds to other metals and oxalic acid, acid is actually used as a cleaner to clean metal because it's such an amazing mopper up. It mops up and it leaves you with a shiny surface but it does the same thing inside your body. It will mop up your calcium, it will mop up your iron, it will mop up any other trace minerals floating around the place. And the liver can deal with it to some extent. The liver can actually produce a bit of uh, oxalic acid as well. So that needs to be dealt with. And this is why vitamin B12 is so important because your liver will use up stores of vitamin B12 to mop up the oxalic acid. So you've now turned carnivore and your body is now starting to release the oxalic acid. So you need to, first of all, as you, you, you guys have said, you've got to do this slowly. You cannot just say, I'm going to give up all the vegetables. You've got to do this slowly. Um, my suggestion is you, you map out what the average amount of oxalic acid is in a month and then divide that so that you know how much to consume in a day and you want to go for about 10 percent so every every week or every few weeks you cut it down by 10 percent 10 percent so that after about six months you're down to roughly around 50 milligrams of oxalic acid and then you maintain that for a little while because you're going to need to take uh, vitamin C, and that if you take too much, that will convert to oxalic acid. So that's not so critical, as long as you try to maintain yourself around 50 milligrams. And sorry, guys, but a cup of tea can be anything between 30 and 60 milligrams of oxalic acid, depending how strong you make it. So you really need to think about these things. You really need to be intelligent about I'm going to do this, but I have to do this structure in a, in a structured fashion. And once you say, okay, now I'm here, I'm carnival. But your body is going to be releasing oxalic acid for years, five, 10, 15 years, depends on the person, depends on how much they've got stored. And during this time, you will need to take some vitamin C, and you will need to take loads of vitamin B12, even though there is vitamin B12 in liver and in grass-fed um, meat, red meat. So even though you've got that, nevertheless, you will need to supplement um, because that is how your body is dealing with the backlog of oxalic acid. And whilst you're at it, you need to supplement with some other things. Um, citrates, you need to supplement with things like zinc citrate, uh, magnesium citrate, possibly calcium citrate. You know, this has to be done on an individual basis. But nevertheless, you need the citrates to mop up the oxalic acid that's been released. If you don't do this, and I've seen this happen, if you're unlucky, you can get kidney stones. And kidney stones can be quite deadly. So yeah. You know, that is important. Like we said, it's it's a gradual process that you need to do and you need to be careful with it. That's why we try to um, you know, we, we work with people to try and um, help them and advise them as they're doing it because it's good to have someone helping you who has that knowledge because absolutely you can't just jump into these things just because it's healthier to eat meat and fat, depending on where your body's at. If you just jump into it, you know, you can get all kinds of side effects, which is 
not because the meat and fat's bad for you, it's just because your body's in such a mess and you, you know, you need to clean it up and sort it out. So where, where are you at now in terms of your, what does your eating look like now? Um, my eating now is um, around 9.30 to 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, I will have a bowl of uh, meat, which is roughly around 300 um, grams of, uh, of protein. If you work on the, on the idea that uh, 250 grams of protein will give you around 40, 45 grams of protein, then I aim to have around 130 to 140 grams a day of protein. So that's what I aim for. Um, and so I have a bowl and I, I buy, I buy um, from Morrison's, I get some beef dripping and uh, I Excellent. just cut out little chunks and I put that in there. Yeah, so that's my meat, because the meat doesn't, because I eat my own cows. And the problem with eating your own cow is not every part of the cow has got fat. Mm. Some parts are fattier than others, right? But you've got to eat the whole cow. You can't just eat part of it. <laughs> the so you got to eat nose the whole to cow. tail. <laughs> nose to tail. Yeah. And so what I do is I just supplement it. I just put fat with it as well. So that's my my uh, my breakfast, if you like, around ten o'clock, nine thirty, ten o'clock, and then around one o'clock or so. I will have, I will treat myself to a, to a sirloin steak with nice fatty bit on the edge. And I'll have a bone broth. So that's the only time of the day when I'll have a bit of salt. I have a tiny minuscule bit of salt in my bone broth and I have no other salt at all. Um, so I have my, and this is, my meat is practically raw. So in fact, what I have in the mornings, I've got down to a fine art. I cut it all down into small sections. I put it in the oven. I've got one of these ovens, an aga, so it's on all the time. So I know that nine minutes cooks it to perfection for me, which is just slightly cooked. So it's mostly raw. And <laughs> so I have that. Then lunchtime, I, I have the steak totally raw. I just slice it up and I just eat it raw. Tastiest thing I, I have. Is the thing is the one part of the day I enjoy the most, <laughs> and then around four thirty, I do the same. I have another bowl of uh, meat with the fat, and uh, that's it. So I aim to eat roughly between ten and four is what six seven hours. So I, I aim to have my my food within seven hours at the most, um, which means that out of twenty four. I've got what about 17, 18 hours that I don't eat. So yeah. the the in my opinion, the best way to fast is slow and regular. Uh, if you go more than 12 hours without food, your liver will start to process backlog. Yeah, whatever chemicals, whatever toxins you go in the fat, whatever, the liver begins to process. So yep. by, by going 17 hours or 18 hours without food, then you're processing backlog and little and often, and that way you also don't lose body mass because once, once you've lost the, uh, the visceral fat, is it the visceral fat, the fat inside of you? Yeah, yeah that's right. Once you've lost that fat, um, then all you've got is the surface fat. And if you stop eating, the weight begins to fall off you. When I was sick, when I was sick with COVID or whatever that it was at the time, um, two weeks, I didn't really feel like eating. And I mean, I was still forcing myself, but not for the first few days. And within that time, I'd lost over half a stone in weight. You know, like, my my wife looked at me and said, "My God, you look like an old man. You, you, your <laughs> legs, you, you got legs like sticks." And uh, so, on that score, I would like to say that people say 
the experts, they say that you stop putting muscle on uh, once you reach past 70 or six, you know, from 50 upwards, you know, you start to lose five, 10% of body mass and it's really hard to get it on. Well, it's not strictly speaking true because I had no problem putting that half, half a stone of body mass back on. And it's not fat, it's muscle. And I'm now 70 and, you know, you can keep putting muscle on as long as you eat enough protein and you do a workout you'll put that as long as long as long as your body is clean as long as your your body can burn the fat as long as it's not been distracted by other poisons your body can recuperate and give you and give you muscle and build muscle yeah it's, yeah you can you can keep building however um you have, and this is why I say you have to keep eating because once you've lost your visceral internal fat, if you stop eating, you can lose you can lose muscle fat. You can lose muscle so quickly, and uh, once you go past a certain age, it's harder to it is harder to put the muscle on. But you know you can still do it. But the last thing I need is to keep losing muscle. I want to keep build. I I, I want to keep building my muscle. I want to. <laughs> I want to reach 85 with more muscle than I've got now. <laughs> is my sink, so you know, is my, is my store. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and just on the, uh, the the muscle gain, you know, while fasting, you know, going more than 17, 18 hours, you're, you're absolutely right about that, Sal. Uh, you know, my older brother does, uh, he's more in the extreme end, does about 22 hours fasting. And wow. a bit heavily meat based, perfect diet, and exercises regularly. And he's actually managed to not only maintain but put on muscle as well. But he that's everyday training. So with the right discipline, you know, that it, it absolutely can be done. So, you know, I totally agree with that. Hmm. Obviously, that's quite a um, that's quite a long time, but you know, people's lifestyles can be, uh, I suppose it depends on your lifestyle as well. Your lifestyle is super yeah. busy, like his is. He's like, okay, well, you know, I'll start at half seven, finish at half nine, and, you know, everything's working perfectly for him, so. How old is he? 47. 47. Yeah. I think as long yeah. as it's inside um, inside a day, I think, is, is better. Like, if you're eating every day... You know, if you're leaving a 16-hour window or a 20-hour window, I think That's it's, the best then, one. Yeah. then it's not so bad. I think it's like you say, like there's certain situations where having like a, a three-day fast, a five-day fast, or something like that could be beneficial to you. But over overall, you don't. I don't think you want to be doing that very regularly. I think you want to be feeding your body, and you know, and giving it what it needs um, each day. So yeah, I, I, unless it's specific reasons, there's probably not too much reason to really do a. a couple day fast uh regularly you just especially if you're eating clean if you're eating clean there's there's no need to if you're if you're intermittent fasting and eating carnivore like the way we do there's no no need to do any longer than that fast none whatsoever in my yeah. opinion yeah. none whatsoever yeah yeah you know if you, if, if you do drugs and alcohol and whatnot then yeah <laughs> you, need, you need to cleanse but if you're pure i mean all i have is water i i drink nothing apart from water yeah so cold water, hot water, tepid water, that's all I have. Sparkling water. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Well, actually... Um, that that can suppress the appetite a little bit. No, no, it's not that. It's the salt. Right. Sparkling water has got salt in it. And if you are, like myself, someone who's damaged their kidneys, and they're still damaged, you know, I mean, they're healing, but I'm not out of the woods yet. Um. And I know this because a um, couple of weeks back, uh, my wife and I we were in the bath, you know, hot bath, and I had quite a bit of the um, the uh, the bubbly water, the sparkling water, and I got a I got a nosebleed, and I go, where's that come from? And then I twigged. I just had too much salt, and the salt was in the um, uh, sparkly, I mean, water. What, yeah. sparkly water yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, interesting uh, yeah 
yeah it goes back to that point isn't it that everything is is personal and you have to you have to find what's optimal for you and what works for you and that may not necessarily work for someone else but it's just finding that which um you've you've had a a long journey there and you seem to have found what what works what what works optimally for you now so how how are you gone gone sorry no no go then yeah, yeah, I, I was just going to say, how, how are you overall in terms of your health now? I take it you're, you're pretty much in good health. I am, I am. I am. I am in really good. Well, OK. So this journey took me to be really, really sick. Because. Once I, I began to change my diet and I started to get really, really sick, I got I went to a lot of people who didn't help me. They made me worse structurally in my body and it's really hard to find someone who's, who really knows what they're up to it's really hard anyway um it wasn't until i found you say you've been looking at my website until i found charlie and charlie is the one who taught me that first of all that i had leaky gut and that it was the aluminium and as soon as i made that connection i got rid of everything aluminium in my house now I eat out of a wooden bowl and a silver spoon. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I put my stuff in the oven in, um, in a clay dish. So, I mean, uh, that's it, you know, enough. And uh, I am now coming, it's taken about three years, I'm now coming to the end of it. But uh, my kidneys would still take a while to, to heal. And my structure, I, I used to do a lot of martial arts and a lot of stretching and whatnot. But over the last uh, seven years or so, that sort of went out of the window. And it was a bit of a shock to me a little while back to realize that I am not as flexible as I used to be. And that is bad news. So I'm now backpedaling fast. And now I'm doing a lot of stretching and I'm going to start doing some yoga. And so I'm, I'm reversing that. So apart from that, I'm really good. I'm very healthy. Um, my stamina is improving all the time. Um, when I started to do the CrossFit here locally, because I used to do it in Edinburgh and then I stopped, but I started again two years ago. And when I started, I couldn't really run. <laughs> 300 meters was like, uh, killing me. Out of breath, just couldn't do it. Now, the other day I did 1,200 meters and I was okay. You know, I think that was as much as I could do, but hey, <laughs> it's, a, oh. it's a heck of an improvement. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'm doing really good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And, and you don't look your age at all, so, so I would never have guessed that you were that age, so that's fantastic. Yeah. It just shows you how the body can regenerate and it does. It does. Look, young and I, and things, you know, whatever age you are. When I was in my 50s uh, and up to the age of 62, I was, I, I'd gone up to 18 and a half stone. And now, if you look at that sideways, I'm 31 and a half inch waist and I'm now 13 stone and I'm solid. Yeah. And I'm still, I'm still, and I'm still, a, I'm still a little bit chunky here. Mm. And the reason why I'm chunky is because my intestines are, are still too big for their boots because all those years of eating roughage distended my, distended my, my large intestine. And the wind, the bloating just increased the size of the tissues. So it's all going back. But, you know, it takes a long time to heal oneself. And I don't want to put anyone off, but simply to be aware that this is not a one-night thing. You, you commit to health, it takes time. And, but the changes happen. The changes do happen, but it takes time. Sure, yeah. and discipline as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's what we say to people: the best, the best investment you can ever make is in your health. Whether that's time, whether that's money, effort, 
it's the best thing you can do. And your story is a great example of firstly, that it's not too late to start. Um, and secondly, that obviously the earlier you start, the better, because the more damage your body's been through, the harder it is for you to do it. But, you know, still, wherever you're at, whoever's listening and watching this, you know, wherever you're at, it's not too late to start. So start now, whether you're 20 years old, 70 years old, it's not too yeah. late to, to start looking after your health um, and, and taking control of it. So I think that's the main message that, that we can take from that. Uh, yeah. I really want to thank you, Sal, for coming on and, yeah. and sharing your story. It's been very insightful to us and I'm sure very insightful to people listening and watching as well. So thank you for that. My pleasure. All the best and to you too. Thank you, Sal. It was very educational and inspirational to hear. So thanks for your time. I saw, I saw someone the other day on a video. He was 94 and he was still jogging. He was pushing himself. Uh, he was getting all manner of um, um, awards for winning and all manner of things. He, he went into the Guinness Book of Records. And uh, I, I said to myself, he's amazing, but I want to be better than him because although he's very strong, I could see that he was a little bit rigid in his movements in certain directions. He could run a lot, lots of, but nevertheless, there's that rigidity that comes in. So I said, yeah, you know, I want to be like him 94, but I got to stay flexible. Yes. <laughs> That's it. It's always good to have goals. Always good to have goals. And a aging is, is a choice at the end of the day. You, your, your years of age will always go up, but actually aging and feeling old is, is entirely a choice. If you look after yourself, you can stay looking young. Let me share one last little bit. Yeah, sure. Yeah, years ago, um, I had a book. It followed me from house to house. And there were letters written by the American Indian chiefs to um, uh, Abraham Lincoln. And there was one letter from one of the chiefs who said, and I hadn't, I, I hadn't understood it at the time, but now in hindsight, I do. He said, he said, our forebears, our ancestors, they used to live to about 150 years. Our memory stretches all the way back to the conquistadors, he says. But then the French came to our lands and they came with their brioche, their breads and their brandies. And gradually the lifespan of our elders began to recede till they reached down to 120, 180. And it is our Western diets which are killing us. And we think, you know, oh, 80 years old, that's a good life. Well, yeah, it is at the moment with our expectations, but that isn't necessarily what is possible for us. Yeah, we can live a lot longer, perhaps not because, you know, most of us have been poisoned from the year dot. And so, you know, there's a lot of damage to, uh, to compensate for, but we certainly can live healthily a lot longer than 80. Yeah. Uh, and I would imagine up to a hundred, if you take care of yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I believe, I believe that there's some research that they've done uh, based on sort of the, the human, um, the human genetic makeup uh, at the sort of level of the chromosomes. And th there's some calculations they do based on it they can do with animals and then with humans that humans should live to around 120 years old based on that but obviously mm -hmm. we don't get the internet now and that is probably entirely down to our, our diet like you said yeah yeah I, well i think it would be uh would, further down the line would be great to have you back on so and to discuss more of that and whenever you're ready give me a tinkle send me an email yeah. i'm yeah. always happy to I'm sure Ryan would be happy with that. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's been great. I've, yeah. I've really enjoyed right, it. It's been a, it's been a great chat. I hope everyone else has enjoyed it too. Uh, we'll be back again next week for for another episode. We'll see you all then, and let's get optimal together.
Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning into the show. I really hope that you enjoyed it. If you have any questions or topics you'd like us to cover on the podcast or you'd like to appear on it, then please contact us at hwpoduk at gmail.com on our website, which is healthwealthuk.com or on any of our social medias, which are at hwpoduk. Please make sure you like, subscribe, share it with all your friends and family and we will see you next week.